talking about where startups or products fail on their path to becoming a global company. That's quite a broad, that's quite a broad title, isn't it? Yes, very open-ended. It's very open-ended, so we have 18 and a half minutes, so this time I can push myself off stage, so that should be fun. I mean, so where do they fail? I don't know. It's, uh, I think it's a really broad topic. Uh, so let's start with uh, maybe like the first thing that we chatted a little bit about backstage. Um, I think sort of like the framework, I would question the whole framework of it, which is, I think, and I said this in the previous panel, I think the best companies start very narrow, right? So before you're thinking about you know, going global, you need to think narrow and like solve very specific pr problem. Now the flip side of it is, a lot of founders think really broadly. And I call it like smarts fallacy. I'm exactly like that. I suffered from it. I, I meet a lot of founders who have this problem. We're too smart. So but, but we, we try to, to solve like a really broad problem instead of solving a really narrow one. But now I have to ask, now we are taught here that we in Europe, we, we think too small, we have to think big. Now you say we have to think narrow. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I have no idea why people are telling you this. I'm telling you exact opposite. Like I really think that, and I just mentioned this in the last panel, I bumped into this awesome startup that's trying to solve local real estate in a way that makes sense here. Uh, it wouldn't make any sense in New York. I think it's wonderful. I don't know how big this company gets. Who cares if the founders can get it off the ground? And then if the founders can get it to be, let's say, how many of you would like to uh, start a company that within four or five years becomes a $20 million business? Okay. How many of you would like to raise maybe a couple hundred K of capital, start the company that becomes $20 million business, and then sell it in five years? Yeah, well, there's your answer, right? Like, you guys should all do that. It's a wonderful idea. I think it's the myth of unicorns and massiveness, and like, I think it's all meaningless. I really do. I'm so happy you're saying that, because we had a conversation early on, and we kind of said, okay, how, how, how can we talk about this broad topic? And you start off saying, look, before you go global, try and succeed local, right? That's, and, and I mean, the thing is, so, and then you said something I really like was, um, try and build a company, create value, and get revenue, sell the product. So, does that mean before we have our global companies and get big-ass investments, that we should just try and build a small, sustainable company? If that works, take the next step? Maybe, and you know, so like we spend a ton of time talking about what makes a great entrepreneurial ecosystem. And Brad Feld, who is one of the co-founders of Techstars, wrote a whole book about it. I can tell you I know a little bit about it from observing New York, LA, uh, a little bit of like Paris, Stockholm, like different places. So there's three pillars. Number one, a ton of smart founders who are willing to forego corporate jobs and start companies, number one. Number two, uh, strong engineering uh, talent, right? So if you think about Silicon Valley, uh, massive engineering talent in Stanford, massive engineering talent at Berkeley's, that kind of fuels it. Same thing in Boston, lots of strong engineers increasingly happening in New York. And then the third one is a ton of angel capital. That's what most ecosystems lack. Uh, I think New York is maybe second in the world in terms of angel capital, and it's actually not that massive. I mean, it's massive compared to other ones. So. Going back to answering the question, those of you who would exit your $20 million companies would become phenomenal angel investors. And so to become an angel investor, you don't need to have a billion dollar exit. You need to have a meaningful exit, where meaningful means you have extra money to invest. So you actually, I think, as a region, could potentially be better off starting smaller companies, generating value quickly, exiting them, and that's gives you guys enough capital to then go at it again, potentially creating bigger companies. I think that's a fascinating insight. I think it's an insight that, that's delivered to Selden. And is, I mean, obviously, being at Techstars, I would imagine companies from all over the world apply to you. Is that a common phenomenon that you have the feeling they're trying to go global, trying to apply with you guys too early? Um, 
Uh, he definitely. I mean, we've seen this. We've seen a bunch of different dynamics. The the very common dynamic that we've seen with companies coming out from Europe, not from your region. We haven't seen a ton, but, but like the dynamic is, hey, I can't raise money in Europe. People don't get what I'm doing. Therefore, I need to go to U.S. where there's a lot more capital, and I'm going to raise capital there. I think that's 99% of the time is just a faulty setup. Um, so, but, but what would I need to, to be or do in order to, let's say, let's say you were to walk out this door later on and some young entrepreneur would pitch their company to you and say, look, this is what I've got. What do you look for if you say, okay, you've got what it takes to take the next step? So, so you're looking local traction, local investment, and kind of an angle to also take it on a global scale. But what is it you're looking for in detail? Is, is there something you can sense that people need? Is there some kind of a, a level, a threshold people need to, to overcome? Not really. I think it's more of like a common sense and the timing and things need to make sense. So first of all, not all the products need to be global. In fact, some products need to stay local and that means they have a ceiling. Like for example, I wasn't born with exceptional athletic abilities. I'm not going to be an Olympic champion and that's okay, but I could be, I could actually run half a marathon and I'm happy with that. It's not necessarily lowering the bar. You can be excellent in what you do and it's just a smaller opportunity. But I think the, going back to your question, when it makes sense for a startup apply, it depends. And here's what it depends on. Some of your companies, should be global day one, meaning you're, you know, you're selling to the global market, you're actually not tailored towards Slovenia or not towards Austria, but you're, you're on the web and you're selling to everybody. That's day one, meaning you're global day one. Other set of companies make sense to once you've proven the market here, that's when you go global. Um, and, you know, the two points that I will make, one is, Time to go global is when you're wildly successful here and you've raised capital from local investors and then you have, uh, you know, a lot of powder to expand to U.S., right? Or secondly, you just expand to U.S. without raising capital, generate revenue there, do successful lending and then raise capital. Now, imagine I, I, I were to be, let's call it a local champion or local champion in the making. I have raised certain, certain money locally. Are there still some sort of pitfalls you see? I mean, I've seen it sometimes that local investors, not talking for Slovenia, but talking for Austria and Germany, the regions where I'm quite familiar with, that often the local investors take quite a high, high amount of equity and therefore somehow reduce the movement of the founding team. Is that something you see often? It happens, right? Like everything is a function of your environment. I, I still think that even if you, so even if you have to give up a lot of equity early on, if you're truly onto something massive, massive, massive that's going to go really, really global, you will make up for that delta when you start really growing. So this is always been my advice to founders, don't sweat early valuations. Fred Wilson wrote about it a whole bunch of times, a whole bunch of other VCs wrote about it. This is what I talk to founders and tech stars. I mean, obviously it needs to be reasonable. Don't give out 70% of your company for 25K. That that's not going to work. But don't over-optimize early valuations because you basically don't have anything yet and that's when you kind of like get to scale, you can make up the delta typically. Are there any, any, any red flags you see? Things you look at in an application and say, oh, if I see this, I'm out? Anything you can share with us? Of course, I mean, you know, to me the biggest red flag is uh, founders who are not self-aware and not intellectually honest with themselves and with people they're pitching. Uh, founders who haven't really done the homework uh, and they're just pitching for the sake of pitching, right? Like that's, that's a really big red flag. Uh, there's subtle stuff, who knows, you know, there's like a company that applied, um, you know, to the last class, the cap table was complete mess, right? I mean, we, we can probably help fix that, but it's a red flag. Um, Founder dynamic is an interesting issue. If there's two or three founders, I would very like I would focus a lot on like how they interact. Uh, sometimes when I, when uh, one of the founders who is not a CEO talking, CEO starts rolling his or her eyes like 
that's a red flag. So, <laughs> so you look out for those kind of details. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I am a very keen reader of people. Is my number one job. As really? much as I'm a study of engineering and business, I, yeah, like I mean, my number one thing that I do at my job is read people. No pressure on me then. That's when people tell me that I read people. You're always going to get oh crap. And that's it's good that I have a beard that you can only see half of my facial expression. I have uh, a company in my next class with the awesomest set of beards you've ever seen. Like you should meet those guys. Fantastic. I, I totally want to meet them. I, I mean, I want to I want to find out all about that. About that. Um, now, obviously, I find that quite interesting because our conversation also before kind of went in, the, in, a, in a positive, different direction than I was expecting, because I really like this local approach. Um, so maybe, maybe for me, I would also like to understand how, how do, what are kind of traction figures you see for people to advise, okay, if this happens, think global. If this happens, stay local. Is this something you can, you can share? Yeah, and, and kind of leaning on what we were talking about in the previous panel, you guys heard from multiple people that investors value growth. And I, I think the, the big thing that I think a lot of founders uh, don't hit is just this notion that to prove that the company is viable, you need to keep growing um, the first week, month, six months, first year, and it needs to be a number Right, and kind of going back to your question, I would say that if you're continuing to grow within your region and it's obvious that there is additional opportunity and you're continuing to expand, then maybe you expand to, you know, from Slovenia to Austria, to Italy, um, you know, to Germany and like other countries in Europe and you continue to see sort of like blue ocean and the numbers continue to support it, you're on your path, right? You still may not have a product for Asia, for example, or US. And when we say global, most people assume it's United States, but it's also, it's, it's kind of like this BS idea that you have to come to US for your dreams to come true. Like, I think your dreams can come true anywhere where you are. You just need to apply yourself, right? Now, there's, there's an interesting slide. As you mentioned, the US right now, obviously, I think for a lot of European founders, it's all about taking the company global, which is also known as taking it to the US, which yeah. I think is, so everyone looks direction west, not very many people direction east, although I think is a, a lot more exciting market. A friend of mine, um, Florian Schwantner, who, 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 who co-founded Runtastic and as, a, as, a, as I mentioned, exited the company last year, he has a beautiful slide comparing US startups to European startups. He says, if there's a European startup with 10 people, they'll have nine engineers and potentially one marketer. In the US, we'll have nine marketers and one engineer. Now, that m leads me to my next question would be, how about marketing? I have a feeling a lot of European startups massively lack in the marketing area, marketing products, selling products, and rather engineer technical solutions. Yeah. Is that an issue? I think it's fantastic. I love it. I, I am a complete nerd and an engineer, and I'm obsessed with anything nerdy or engineering driven. I mean, to me, having marketing too early um, you know, in your business, again, we're making massive generalizations, which is very dangerous. But to me, I think that no matter what business you're starting, you need to obviously like build the product and sell the product. So I think engineers who are business inclined are the most advent, you know, have the biggest advantage. That's what we see in Techstars. Most of our teams are actually comprised, um, you know, with engineering teams and like have really strong product cores. Now that said, for enterprise businesses, you do need to have sales chops because otherwise you just can't sell it. But I think if I had to pick one, I would pick engineering very early and then I would pick a lot of sales late in a later sort of like part of the company life cycle. Um, we also spoke, I mean, obviously, I also want to, because I, I think we have an absolute agreement on, on, on starting local and trying to become a local hero before taking the step. Um, I have to ask this question. Do you need to go to the Valley to be a global success? Again, it depends on what sort of company you're building. Historically, Valley afforded um, larger companies and Valley built larger number of like bigger companies. But for example, if you're in media, if you're in fashion, if you're in ad tech, if you're in media, New York or LA could make more sense. Um, in general, Valley is more capital uh, bigger companies still holds, I think, sort of the edge in terms of what you can get there. But on the flip side, it's also ridiculously competitive. Like, why is it, like, even 
sim seemingly minor thing, you as a company in the Valley going to struggle immensely to retain your engineers. Like, that may seem like a small thing, but it's a massive problem. Like, your engineers get poached by other amazing companies all the time. So, there's, everything is like a double-edged sword. What's the thing you're looking out for the most right now? Is there something where you say, okay, I'm done with that topic, I'm done with this type of founders, those are the ones I find the most interesting. Is there something you're starting to sense? Yeah, I, and, and I actually write a lot about stuff that I sort of do at Techstars on my blog. One of my recent posts is about founder market fit, and I think it's one of the most important insights that you as founders can have. Why are you doing the why are you building the business that you're building? Is it just because you want to be an entrepreneur and you're enamored with that concept? That's fine, but really you're disadvantaged when you do that. So think of it this way. When you go to school, you have to pay for education. Um, like in US, if you get lucky, your parents pay some of it, you pay the rest of it, you get loans. So you're paying to go to school. Here, I think education is free, but in general, in some parts of the world, you pay to learn. When you're a founder who starts a company in the market where you don't know anything about the market, you're going to pay to learn. So like majority of the founders are super smart and smart people figure stuff out, but it will take you time. So you're paying with your time. And if you get investment, you're paying with investor dollars. And by the way, good investors hate that. That's why they don't fund founders who are sort of outsiders to the market. And it's been sort of like written up a lot. I literally have, you know, data on the companies that went through Techstars. Most of my founders have, you know, really strong product market fit. And I'm very obsessed with that concept because I think that it's, I think that it's hugely important, especially in the enterprise. We're nearly, we're kind of running out of time, but today I saw one, one article that said and I thought it was a beautiful new bullshit bingo word to add to my long list of uh, startup bullshit bingo. And it said something about looking for blue flame within founders. Have you heard of that, blue flame? If not, I'm really happy. <laughs> what, what it means... Well, like resilience? No, no, actually what it meant, blue flame, they mean that, you look, that many people are looking for young, ideally unmarried founders who are willing to go like above and beyond and half kill themselves. Is that, is that something? you look out for, is it not? There is no formula, you know? There, so, so think of it this way. Every single human being is different. We're different combinations of genes. Every single company is different, right? There's patterns across people, patterns across companies. There is no single formula for what makes a successful founder. But I think a really important ingredient and another thing that I wrote recently about is resilience. And some of the younger founders actually don't have it. They give up too quickly. So resilience is closely linked to conviction and vision and also to product market fit. If you really know the market, you become convinced that the company you're building should exist. And that's when you obtain this conviction and it emanates from you and other people can feel it. So I think when they talk about the blue flames and like, what makes exceptional founders truly stand out is this sort of thing inside that we can all feel, right? But I don't think it's just the young founders. That makes me quite happy. Now, if, if I could summarize this talk, and I mean, to be honest, I, I think I, I'd love to talk on for an hour with you. It's, it's so much fun, but we've got about 15 seconds left. <laughs> so, so I'll try and summarize what you said and you just say, no, that was wrong, or yes. Okay. Um, or add something to it. So you're basically saying, if you want to go global, if you want to build a successful company, Go local, become a local hero, don't necessarily have to, have to go international, but before that, go local. Find something you're really expert in, something you love, love sufficiently that you're willing to suffer for it and not give up at the first thing. And if you do happen to, 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 to successfully sell your company, maybe also become a local hero by starting off local ecosystems and reinvesting and becoming a mentor. Is, is that kind of... Yeah. yeah? Perfect. Yeah. Wow, that was a short answer. And that bombshell, it's been a pleasure. You're hanging out until today, tomorrow? Yeah, yeah. I'm around. So you can try and pitch that gentleman if you know what you're talking about, if you are willing to go from local to global, if you love what you're doing, if you're willing to suffer. It's been a pleasure. Is that right? Will you sign that? Alex, it's been yes. a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much.